Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Throughout his work, All Things Are Possible, and really throughout the, his corpus as a whole, you're going to see Lev Shestov talking at, at a number of different places about ultimate realities and questions. And sometimes he'll use other phrasing as well. For example, in uh, part one, chapter 28, where he tells us that literature deals with the most difficult and important problems of existence. So it's not always exactly the same formulation, but we are talking about things that are most basic and really inescapable. <clears throat> so talking about existential questions is a good way to get at it. And, and some, some of the things that we might consider ultimate questions might be viewed as not all that existential, not just about us, but about the cosmos as a whole. But if we look at them in the right light, they are also existential. So if you think about what some of the ones that he mentions in this work are, he talks about, you know, understanding or knowing life. <laughs> That's one of the fundamental questions. People come to an intro to philosophy class and they, they come in and say, what, what is the meaning of life? And then the philosophers say, well, you know, there's a lot of different answers to that. Well, which one is it? And that's an ultimate question that we, we really can't evade, but we also can't answer in some sort of general sense that's going to convince everybody. Uh, whether we have freedom or not, what we ought to do with our freedom, that's a fundamental philosophical question as well. Some people have devoted entire careers to arguing that we have it or don't have it, or just in this way. He's going to also talk about a, a fundamental problem of justice. That is a really central one. And, um, you know, it, it does bedevil a number of people. The nature of the universe itself, you know, all the different things in it. Is it bounded? Is it not? These metaphysical questions. Even the, the question of the scope of human rationality or reason. Maybe there's a reason with a capital R writ large that's the mind of God or some cosmic logos, or maybe everything is totally irrationality. What is the nature of our human reason in relation to this? And we could add other things. How should society be organized? All the things that we talk about as the big questions when we're introducing people to philosophy, we often give them a hope that, well, if you just study philosophy, you're going to get the answers to these. And you will indeed get answers, but they may not be the answers. And Shestov is, as you're going to see, rather a skeptic. He does talk about why it is that people think that uh, philosophy or other things that are doing similar work like literature are going to provide us with these answers. And I should pause here for a moment. If we say that philosophy can't answer these questions or can't address these questions, that does not satisfy the demand on people's part for some answer to these. So if philosophy for a while abandons its pretenses to delve into and to study these, well, then the sciences will, or you know, whether the, the natural sciences or the social sciences, or other you know, attitudes and uh, projects will come along and say, we've got the answer, and there will be people ready to pick it up could be a political platform and program. It could be some other social doctrine. It could be a religion. People want answers to the, these questions. And so in uh, chapter 38 of part one, he talks about something that he attributes to the Russians, but I think we could say 
This is actually a perennial issue. He says, a strange impatience has taken possession of Russian writers lately. They're all running a race after the ultimate words. They have no doubt that the ultimate words will be attained. The question is, who will lay hold of them first? And so when you're in, you might call it a saturated environment where people think that there's, you know, the answer is right around the corner. We just have to find it. It, leads, it creates a certain kind of credulity on the part of those who take things seriously and want to find answers. They think, yeah, I'm just going to go here and I'll get the answer. And they often flip from answer to answer to answer to answer, sort of like the youths that he talks about later on in part two as moving from you know, positivism to Kantianism to this to that. Um, there's a reason why people do that. There's a reason why people leave religion and then become atheists and get onto all sorts of skeptic forums. And then, you know, after they've done some crusading for that, they, they abandon that and find some other thing and slip into new age thought or what, whatever it is that they're going to do. They get politically involved and start, you know, talking about all sorts of things on the left or the right as if these have ultimate importance. There's another thing that, that goes on, though, and he talks about this in uh, chapter 45, almost near the end of part two. He's talking about the, the Russian spirit. And again, you know, we, I think we can ask, are we, is this just about Russia and Europe at the time, or could we talk about this in our own cultural situation? And he says... While European thinkers have for centuries been beating their brains over insoluble problems, we've only just begun to try our powers. So we could think about this in terms of like, you know, what the cultural elites have been doing and then what the rest of us, the masses, have been doing, those of us who didn't come from an academic or cultured background. And he says that we don't have any failures behind us. Um, so we don't actually see quite, quite what's going on. Other people's experience is not ours. We are not bound by their conclusions. And he says, the most skeptical Russian hides a hope at the bottom of his soul. Hence our fearless, uh, fearlessness of the truth, realistic truth, which is so stunned European critics, right? Uh, he says the Westerner is self-reliant. He knows that if he doesn't help himself, no one will help him. So he directs all his thoughts to making the best of his opportunities. The Russian has a different sort of point of view. He says, um, here we go. Um, a Russian believes he can do anything, hence he's afraid of, of nothing. So he, he thinks that, you know, we can attain these ultimate truths. Whereas other people might be, uh, we should be skeptical of this, you know. And he's got this great passage here where he talks about a kind of uh, rhetoric. Here we go. Um, it says, our confident truthfulness, like European rhetoric, turns out to be beyond truth and falsehood. He's echoing Nietzsche's beyond good and evil in that case. The young East and the old West suffer from the restrictions imposed by truth, but the former ignores the restrictions while the latter adapts itself to them. So this is, these are possible ways to address these hopes and demands for resolutions of ultimate realities. Why does philosophy come to think that it has reached them and is able to supply them to people? That is another question that is, that is being dealt with here. Um, we look at uh, chapter 111 of part one, where he tells us that every philosophical world conception starts from some or other solution of the general problem of human existence and proceeds from this to direct the course of human life in some particular direction or another. So every philosophy, he, uh, Shostov has a view of philosophy as largely oriented by our existential condition and the situations that we find ourselves in, um, telling us that, that you know, very often philosophy thinks that it's completely autonomous and completely rational, but it's really being driven by other things. And now notice what it's doing. It's starting out from the, the existential situation that we're in, where we're puzzled about ultimate realities, and then it tries to provide us with some sort of solution. Uh, Shestov tells us we have neither the power nor the data for the solution of general problems. Because of this, all our moral deductions are arbitrary. They witness to our prejudices if we're naturally timid or our propensities and tastes if we're self-confident. So, you know, this is, this is saying that philosophy is not as general 
as it claims to be. Uh, if we look at uh, chapter 41 of part 2, there is another very interesting discussion about metaphysical consolations, where he says that the more that you piece to the ultimate pierce to the ultimate ends of the infinite metaphysical problems, the more finite they reveal themselves. Why do people engage in metaphysics, in exploring the fundamental questions? Because they want answers, and they want answers that will satisfy them in some way. And so metaphysical systems are providing that sort of consolation to people. What this means is that the ways in which the ultimate questions are being framed and the ultimate realities that philosophy is supposed to be getting to are really quite arbitrary, capricious, contingent. They are not absolute. They are not universal. They're not even possessing enough generality. They may feel that way to people who are working on them, but that's not really the case. Here we come to the crux of it. Have we actually made any progress on these, these ultimate you know, questions? And Shostov says, no. And he says so at a couple different points. So here's a great section, uh, uh, chapter 51 of part one. He tells us that the so-called ultimate questions troubled mankind in the world's dawn as badly as they trouble us now. So even when we're you know, looking at things in a non-philosophical way, looking at these origin stories, now he picks a, you know, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, but we could take any mythology that we want. There are fundamental questions being framed and addressed there. He says, Adam and Eve wanted to know, so they plucked the fruit at their risk. Cain, whose sacrifice did not please God, raised his hand against his brother, and it seemed to him he committed murder in the name of justice, in vindication of his own injured rights. This question of justice is an ultimate one. He goes on and he says, nobody has ever been able to understand why God preferred Abel's sacrifice to that of Cain. And this is something that's kind of interesting. If you think about the way that this story is told, you know, in catechism or in, in our popular culture, don't be like Cain, you know, he's a bad guy. And if you read the biblical story, you will see that, that Cain gets angry and God asks him, why have you grown angry and why has your face fallen? And he also warns Cain, he says, you've got a master sin, it's lying at, at the door, it will master you if you don't. So there's a little bit more to the story than that. But he, Cain, you know, just his response is to go out and kill Abel. And then, of course, we have the, well, where's your brother? Ah, I'm not my brother's keeper, all that sort of stuff, right? Raises other questions. But the fundamental question is, why did God favor Abel over Cain? What was fair about that? You know, wouldn't God know what was going to happen if he did that? Shouldn't he have given better counsel? These are ultimate questions of justice. And we're no closer to answering these, whether it's about Cain, some, some mythological person way back in the past, or whether it's about questions of justice right now. Questions of justice are tangled. And he goes on and he says... Um, Everything right now is being unriddled and explained. If we compare our knowledge with those of the ancients, we appear very wise. But we're no nearer to solving the riddle of eternal justice than Cain was. Progress, civilization, all the conquests of the human mind have brought us nothing new here. Like our ancestors, we stand still with fright and perplexity before ugliness, disease, misery, senility, death. All that the wise men have been able to do so far is to turn the earthly horrors into problems, into things that we could solve. And, you know, over 100 years have passed since Shestoff wrote these down. Haven't we, you know, learned a lot about the human body and about the brain and about how to arrange society? Aren't we so much more advanced than the, the people he's talking about now? According to Shestoff, Yes, we're advanced and our technology has gotten better. We haven't figured out the, the, the eternal riddle of justice. It still bedevils us. It's still there. So this is, uh, this is a, a, a real issue here. He says, uh, The modern educated man with the wisdom of all the centuries of mankind at his command knows no more about it than the old singer who solved the universal problems at his own risk. 
We, the children of a moribund civilization, we old men from our birth, are in this respect as young as the first man. He has another passage where he says something quite similar. Uh, this is, uh, here we go, Par- this is, uh, chapter 66, part one. In the ultimate questions of life, we are not a bit nearer the truth than our ancestors were. Everyone knows it, and yet so many go talking about infinity without any hope of ever saying anything. So this is going to be you know, an important part where we'll get to what we ought to do. And actually, let me jump forward a little bit here. He says, instinct doesn't mock. It ignores the wise, leads us by impossible ways to ends. Our divine reason would hold absurd if it could only see them in time. But reason is always lagging behind. We can't just rely on reason to make progress in these matters. A bit earlier in chapter 28, he also tells us, Uh, about literature, right? I mentioned this before. Literature deals with these most difficult and important problems of existence. And because of this, literatures consider themselves the most important of people. He doesn't just mean people writing literature. He means people using literature. He means people who talk about literature, who tell other people about what the literature actually means. And so, you know, Should we just uh, have a sort of pessimism? Ah, we can't really understand anything. We can understand some things, but when it comes to ultimate questions, we can't really make any progress. Well, we still have to figure out what we're going to do in our life in relation to things. So Shostov does provide us some advice and some useful responses. One is very early on, and this is in Chapter 9, Part 1. He says, We know nothing of the ultimate realities of our existence, nor shall we ever know anything. Let that be agreed. So very pessimistic or skeptical point of view. What should we do? So he goes on and he says, doesn't follow that therefore we must accept some or other dogmatic theory as a way of living, not even positivism, which has such a skeptical face on it. It only follows that we are free to change our conception of the universe as often as we change our boots or gloves, and that constancy of principle belongs only to one's relationships with other people in order that they may know where and uh, to what extent they may depend on us. On principle, we should respect order in the external world and chaos in the inner. And so... This is one possible solution to it. We say we're going to go after these ultimate realities, but we're going to do it in our own way. We're not going to expect anybody else to understand what we're doing. I think there's another really helpful discussion in chapter 122 about the difference between knowing and understanding. He tells us that the effort to understand people or life or the universe prevents us from getting to know them at all. And so he cautions us against a a deep problem. To know and to understand are two concepts which are not only non-identical, but just the opposite of one another in meaning. We think we've understood a phenomenon if we've included it in a list of others previously known to us. And so it could be that we can't actually understand these ultimate questions in the sense that he's talking about there, classifying them turning them into problems, maybe, in fact, to to lose sight of them. But that doesn't mean that we can't know anything in relation to them. And as a matter of fact, perhaps leaving behind the concern about understanding would be a way to allow ourselves to get to, to know them in a more existential, intimate, particular way. He also tells us that we shouldn't wait for ultimate truths uh, from philosophy. This is in uh, chapter 40 of of part two. Um, He says that that's a mistake. He says people go to philosophers for general principles. Philosophers supply them. What sense is there in them? None at all. Nature demands individual creative activity from us. People don't understand this, so they wait forever for the ultimate truths from philosophy, which they will never get. And so instead, he says, grow up, be an adult, find your own ways of approaching it. He says, why should not every grown up person be a creator, live in his own way at his own risk and have his own experience? So, you know, this is advocating a very experimental attitude towards life. Finally, going back to that section where he was talking about the Europeans 
and the Russians and the contrast between them in uh, chapter 45. After talking about this confident truthfulness, he comes down and he says, um, only we find unendurable a rhetoric which poses as truth and a truthfulness which would appear cultured. Such a masquerade would try to make us believe that truth, which is only limitedness, has a real objective existence, which is offensive. Until the contrary is proved, we need to think that only one assertion has or can have any objective reality. And what is that? Nothing on earth is impossible. You know, the title of the work, All Things Are Possible, this is the sort of converse of it. Nothing on earth is impossible. Every time someone wants to force us to admit that there are other more limited and limiting truths, we must resist with every means we can lay our hands on. Um, and so this would be a way of structuring our approach to these ultimate questions. We can't get away from them. We can't resolve them. They are, you could say, part of the human condition. 